be afraid, Paul. I have much people in this city. And there's great hope in that, that in the middle of the most immoral place, probably even in the whole Roman Empire, God had much people. And we can take confidence in that, that today, in the culture that we live in, God has much people. Praise God. But there was a lot of issues from their culture that were bleeding over into the church, and Paul writes to address some of those issues. And uh, so take comfort today that although a lot of the things that may be addressed in 1 Corinthians are current, they're relevant, they're issues that we're facing here today, we can also have uh, great victory just like the church in Corinth did uh, when they obeyed this epistle. Praise God. So our focus thought this morning is that no one can boast about his past, for the grace of God brings salvation. The benefits of Calvary provide the opportunity for all to have the Holy Ghost within, making it possible to glorify God in body and spirit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 9 through 20. We're going to start at verse 9. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Don't, don't think that it's okay. He lists all these sins here. He says, Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That sounds pretty bleak, but look at verse 11. And such were some of you. Praise God. So this is you. <laughs> this is the way you were living. Praise God. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now, I just want to pause here. Paul is quoting a few things that the Corinthians were saying. They would say things, all things are lawful for me. I can do whatever I want. I'm saved. God loves me. I can live how I please. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And he said, yes, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Just because I'm allowed to do whatever I want doesn't mean that I should. If I want to please the Lord, there's going to be some things I need to refrain from. And they had this other expression, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. Any appetite, you just satisfy it. Uh, today, people would say, if it feels good, do it. Same kind of thinking, that just whatever feels good, just follow your heart kind of stuff. Well, the Bible says guard your heart, not follow your heart, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I think Pastor David mentioned last weekend that uh, I believe it's in Jeremiah 17:9 that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, so your heart will deceive you. And the warning here is don't be deceived. So he contrasts this idea that your body, just whatever appetites your body has, you just fulfill them and that's okay. He says, no. He said, the, now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, who will also raise up us by his own power. Jesus rose from the dead so that we also could rise from the dead to redeem us, not just soul and spirit, but also our physical bodies. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth without the body, he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Jesus purchased you 
on the cross of Calvary. You have been bought with a great price. Praise God. And do not sell yourself so cheap. Give yourself to God. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Let your life belong to Him. He has redeemed you from sin. He has purchased you with His own blood. He has called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Praise God. What a wonderful, wonderful life God has for us. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I love the way that the Apostle Paul addresses this. And, you know, so many people that fall into uh, sexual sin, fornication, whatever, it's due to uh, low self-esteem. They don't consider themselves all that valuable or whatever. But Paul just points out, you've been bought with a great price. God loves you so much that he went to the cross for you. And uh, we don't stand here today to judge anybody. We're here to just encourage you to live for the Lord. Praise God. So getting into our lesson today, Christianity began among the Jews but rapidly spread to the Gentile world where it was received with great enthusiasm by the poor, uneducated, and lower class members of society. For these multitudes, Christianity offered social equality, justice, and hope for a better life in the world to come. The early Christians displayed a remarkable tolerance and surprising lack of prejudice toward the social standing of new converts. No one was turned away because of his past life. The new converts might have been thieves, prostitutes, or even murderers, but repentance, baptism, and being filled with the Holy Ghost made them new creations in Christ. How many are thankful for that this morning? It doesn't matter what's in your past. What's in your future is changed because of the gospel. Praise God. In in time, some people forgot how bad they had been. They began to feel as if they merited salvation because of their own goodness. In our lesson, the Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthians how far the Lord had brought them. He showed them once again that those who claim they belong to Christ must forsake their sinful practices and beliefs. The Corinthians had a tendency to become puffed up with spiritual pride. Paul reminded them of their sinful past to bring them back to a spiritual lifestyle of humility. And humility is the key to walking with God. Uh, I was talking with Sister Betty Lou before service. She said, follow peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You have to have peace to go with that holiness. Praise God. We have to have both together. Praise the Lord. So our past, if we had continued in that lifestyle, we were unfit for kingdom of God. God's holiness sets him apart from anything that is not holy. Nothing that is unclean or sinful can approach him or stand in his presence. No one is fit to enter the kingdom of God in his or her personal goodness or merit. There are no good people and bad people. I'll just say that. We're either in covenant with the Lord or we're not. That's, that's salvation. It has nothing to do with how good you are. It has nothing to do with how bad you are or have been. It has everything to do with are you in covenant with God? Have you obeyed the gospel? Praise the Lord. Now, because we've obeyed the gospel, we live, uh, the obligations of that is to live a holy lifestyle out of thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord. But there are no uh, differences. We are all sinners. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Uh, it takes the application of the mercy and sacrifice of Jesus Christ to one's life to enable him to come into the presence of God. The Apostle Paul listed a number of sinful people who will not inherit a place in the kingdom of God. The list was a reminder to the Corinthians of what they had been prior to God's merciful work of grace in their lives. Remember, at the end of this list, Paul's going to say, such were some of you. This was your lifestyle before Christ. This was all of you. <laughs> you were all coming from this same background of immorality and uh, wickedness and all these things. But the gospel has changed you. Uh, so the first thing he mentions is the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. To be unrighteous is to do the wrong thing or simply to avoid doing right. To be righteous is to do the right thing. The right thing is always in agreement with God's expectations of human behavior. So to be righteous is to be in right standing before God, to live a life that is pleasing to Him, uh, that does not uh, go contrary to His Word. Uh, so some people are quite remarkable in their ability to do what is good and proper. They appear to have a natural tendency to do the right thing. I wish I was one of those people. I am not. Uh, <laughs> I think my wife is. But they avoid sin and wickedness without any great effort. 
Others find it very difficult to do what is right or expected of them. It takes tremendous effort on their part to change their lifestyle. If we were to judge human beings, we might be inclined to believe that righteous folks deserve salvation. Yet scripture teaches that all have sinned. Every single one of us have sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. Paul went further and declared, There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Whatever spirituality a human being has on his own is insufficient to bring about his salvation. We need a godly righteousness that can only come from being filled with the Holy Ghost. When God fills us with his Holy Spirit, that's how we can become holy. It's only with the help of the Lord. I cannot please God in my flesh. It is impossible. Romans 8 talks about this. The carnal mind cannot please God. It is impossible to please God in our flesh. We need the Holy Ghost. Praise God. We need his holiness living in us, his Holy Spirit in us. Praise God. So to be righteous, I cannot be righteous on my own. I need the power of the gospel. I need the power of the Holy Ghost. I need Jesus living in me. Jim Elliott said this, in reading of the scriptures, I find a great moral power. Therein am I made aware of two great forces for good in human experience, the fear of God and the grace of God. Without the fear of God, I should not stop at doing evil. The fear of God restrains from evil. Without the grace of God, I should have no desire to approach positive goodness. The one is a deterrent from evil. The other is encouragement to good. Praise God. The grace of God will keep us. It will help us. Praise God. And, of course, we are only saved by God's grace. So Paul gives out this great list. And, again, we're not here to judge anyone this morning, but we are here to uh, preach truth and love. The first thing that he mentions is fornicators. Fornication is defined as human sexual intercourse other than between a man and his wife or sexual intercourse between a spouse and an unmarried person. Fornication was commonly practiced in the ancient world under the banner of religious rituals. Many of the pagan temples featured male and female prostitutes who engaged in sexual practices as part of the worship experience for a particular god or goddess. However, God considers sexual activity outside of the marriage relationship to be sin. He designed human sexuality to be enjoyed within the context of a human, uh, of a responsible, lifelong commitment of marriage between a man and a woman. And again, God is not against sex. He's against sex outside of marriage. Uh, so God intended sexuality as the means of reproduction as well as the integral part of human relationship. However, our society has been preoccupied with sex, and the media goes to great lengths to encourage premarital and extramarital relations. This attitude directly opposes God's plan. His word declares that fornication is sin. God's displeasure with fornication is just as real as for any other sin, and the consequences are serious. Fornication raises the risk of becoming infected with sexually transmitted diseases as well as unplanned pregnancies. Some people have been very promiscuous but never had to deal with pregnancy or disease. They may feel that they got away with something, but they are wrong. Nothing escapes God's all-seeing eyes. Born-again people should emphasize the sacredness of sex and respect its importance in God's eyes. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians 6, 13 and 18. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Uh, C.S. Lewis said this, there's no getting away from it. The old Christian rule is either marriage with complete faithfulness to your partner or else total abstinence. Chastity is the most unpopular of our Christian virtues. And Christians get mocked in the media all the time because we do take this stance. And it has been that way for 2,000 years. Praise God. <laughs> it's not changed. But God's rules are different. And we are blessed when we obey and follow his way. The next thing he lists here is idolaters. Idolatry is the worship of anything or anyone other than the Lord. Idolatry distinctly goes against God's teachings. Exodus 20, 3 to 5 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous 
God. God says, I'm not going to share my glory with another. Don't put anything else before me. He says, I'm a jealous God. And that's in a positive sense. Sometimes we think of jealousy as a bad thing, but think of a marriage. It's a good thing. <laughs> Protects the relationship, that kind of thing. But God says, I'm not going to share you with somebody else. I'm not, I'm not ready to share you. You're going to worship me alone. And we can think, oh, well, we don't bow down to statues. But we put other things ahead of God. <laughs> Let's say, how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you spend your life? What you invest in, what is important to you, does it come before God? If it comes before God, it may be an idol in your life. And the Bible says covetousness is idolatry. And sometimes we worship at the altar of self, idolatry. <laughs> <laughs> we worship ourselves, and we just want to do what we want to do, and that is not putting God first and his ways first. Christians are not to allow anything to come between them and God. God alone deserves our worship, adoration, and praise. We should esteem nothing or anyone more than God, and that includes the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Montreal Canadiens, <laughs> Toronto Raptors. <laughs> They call them the hockey gods because people do worship them. And <laughs> I'm not against sports, just don't make them your god. Um, so <laughs> make sure I make that clear. The contrast between idolatry and Christianity is great. Idolaters make their gods, their gods do not make them. They carry their gods, their gods do not carry them. They protect their gods, their gods do not protect them. They sacrifice to their gods. Their gods do not sacrifice for them. In contrast, Christians believe they are God's workmanship. They believe they are supported by God's everlasting arms. Deuteronomy 30 through 27. They believe God is in their very present help in trouble. Psalm 46 and 1. They are convinced that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God. While we were against him, while we were living in disobedience, while we were sinning, God loved us so much that he came and sacrificed his life on the cross of Calvary to take our place. Praise God. Hallelujah. Perhaps everyone has performed idolatry in one way or another. Martin Luther stated, idolatry is not only the adoration of images, but also trust in one's own righteousness, works, and merits, putting confidence in riches and power. Perhaps in that sense, everyone has been idolatrous at some point in his life. We must elevate the Lord and bring anything that comes, bring down anything that comes between him and us. Praise God. Uh, William Cowper said this, The dearest idol I have ever known, whatever the, uh, that idol be, help me to tear it from its throne and worship only thee. Praise God. Montaigne, who lived in the 16th century, wrote, Man is certainly crazy. He cannot make a worm, and yet he makes gods by the dozen. <laughs> you know, man has never been able to create life from non-life. They've tried experiments. They've failed, despite the propaganda coming from the evolutionary side of the table. Uh, in fact, they actually prove that you can't. But anyway, don't get, uh, get into all that today. But man can't even make a worm, but he makes idols. Well, the next thing on the list here is adulterers. Kind of covered this under fornication, but Jesus taught that adultery is sin. It weakens the marriage relationship. He forbade any improper relationships and compromises or, weaken, or weakens marriage. Jesus clearly taught that marriage was a contractual relationship leading to a lifelong loving commitment. For this reason, he urged monogamy and the putting away of sexual affairs among married people. Married couples should realize that marriage is a binding contract for life. Husbands and wives should avoid any outside relationship or affection shown to others that might compromise their marriage. They should be reminded they are married for better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, until death separates. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, I believe Pastor David covered this very well last Sunday morning, so I won't get into it too deep. Uh, there are some limited instances in Scripture where uh, the Lord allows divorce, but Jesus said it was because of the hardness of your hearts, in most cases, lack of repentance or lack of willingness to reconcile, whatever. Um, but we, as Christians, do believe in the importance of marriage. Thieves, thou shalt not steal, Exodus twenty fifteen. Stealing is sin. 
From the time of Moses, it was forbidden. Stealing deprives the rightful owners of the use and value of things they have earned or purchased. Just as there are no white lies, there are no petty thefts. There is no difference in God's eyes in a person stealing a penny or taking a thousand dollars. Theft is theft, and stealing is sin. In fact, Jesus said, he that is unfaithful in little will be unfaithful in much. And you say, well, I would never go into Walmart and shoplift. But do you download unpaid for, pirated (laughs) music or videos online? (laughs) Oh, I just got too close to home. Talk about something else, preacher. (laughs) Oh, you mean that's that's stealing? (laughs) Oh, I'm going to just make all kinds of enemies this morning. Uh, Don't shoot the messenger, though. So, (laughs) we want to walk with integrity. I was a little shocked when I moved to Sudbury. Sudbury has a culture of stealing from their employer. They do. Especially in the mining and welding and all that kind of stuff. Uh, (laughs) My grandfather was a contractor, and he had to make all of his employees empty their nail bag at the end of the day because they were taking nails home one pouch at a time. (laughs) Come back in the morning with an empty nail bag. He's like, well, you went home with a full one. What's going on? (laughs) Suddenly they're collecting nails at home. And uh, people think, oh, well, nobody will notice. It's just a little bit. Employers got all kinds of money. doesn't matter. It's not about how much money your employer has. It's about walking with integrity. Praise God. And that saying that it's easier to get forgiveness than permission is not true. Sometimes you can get permission. I, I've been blessed that way. I used to ask for stuff all the time from the owner of the company and say, sure, take it. <laughs> it's going in the garbage anyway. Uh, so walking with integrity. Praise God. Perhaps the best solution to stopping thieves was provided by a London taxi driver. He used to wrap up his garbage each day and leave it in the back seat of his cab. Always, by the end of the day, it was gone. Someone had taken it and gotten a big surprise, maybe big enough to make the thieves stop and think before they stole the next time. (laughs) Good way to get rid of your garbage. (laughs) Just put a bow on it and put it in the back seat. (laughs) It's gone by the end of the day. (laughs) And, I mean, you look today, package theft has become a big deal. You know, everybody's going to have a doorbell camera now so they get their Amazon and all this stuff. Uh, it's incredible. But the Bible, of course, condemns theft. Covetous. Exodus twenty seventeen. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Okay. If you've been going down this list so far and saying, not me, not me, not me, I think I've probably got closer to somebody. I, by the time we're done here, I'm going to make sure everybody hears the sinner. Um <laughs> Covetous is wanting for yourself what another person has. It differs from stealing in that nothing is actually taken. It is a sin of the mind. It involves greed and desire for things that belong to others. So we can (laughs) not take it, but it's the wanting it that is in itself a sin. Examples given of the you ever heard of the monkey trap? You get a narrow neck bottle and put some peanuts in there or something, and a monkey reaches in, grabs them, and now he can't get his hand back out. They actually used to capture monkeys in Africa that way. That they would rather not let go of the treat in the bottle than not be captured. <laughs> they would allow themselves to be captured because they couldn't let go of what that thing was they wanted so bad. And We laugh at the monkey, but how many times do we do the same thing with God? We won't let go of that one thing we want that God is saying, give it to me. Give it to me. And there's freedom in giving it to the Lord, but we want to hang on to it and remain imprisoned by our own desire. 1 Timothy 6, 6 6-11, the Apostle Paul gave some excellent advice regarding covetousness and being satisfied with what we have. 
that godliness with contentment is great gain. You can pursue money. Think, well, if I just had another dollar an hour, I'd be happy. If I just had <laughs> that bigger house or whatever it is that you're financial goal might be so if I just had that then I'd be happy well then you get that and you're like oh well now I got to renovate that house <laughs> well now I'm in that house oh I, I, now we need to do this other thing now we need a pool now we need <laughs> whatever and your Bible says he that loves silver will not be satisfied with silver you can accumulate vast amounts of wealth and still want more and that's a heart issue Proverbs 38 to 9 said, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So the writer said, Don't make me so rich that I think I don't need God and don't let me become so poor that I steal. But let me have contentment. Praise God. Moving on. Drunkards. Drunkenness is associated with foolishness and irresponsible behavior. Because drunkards lose control of themselves and often say and do ridiculous things, they are often comical figures and the object of jokes and ill-favored humor. Christians must forsake alcohol as a beverage because of the harm it causes to the human body and because of its association with an out-of-control lifestyle. Alcoholism is responsible for 50% of all auto fatalities. Uh, today's stats, that's right behind texting. 80% of all home violence, 80% of all home violence, alcohol involved. 30% of all suicides, 60% of all child abuse, alcohol involved. 65% of all drownings. When you look at these stats... What would be the benefit to society if everybody just decided to quit drinking? Can you imagine? If everybody just quit drinking. Well, we'd have a 50% reduction in auto fatalities, an 80% reduction in home violence, 30% reduction in suicide, 60% reduction in child abuse, 65% in drownings. That's incredible. 100 years ago, Governments looked at this and said, we're just going to ban alcohol. Made it worse. <laughs> Prohibition. Because <laughs> people still wanted their alcohol. <laughs> so then they just took it to the black market. You had Al Capone and rum runners like my great-grandmother and all that stuff. But there was just, <laughs> yeah, she was a pirate. <laughs> um, so there's all this kind of stuff that people's problem is not following rules. It's a heart issue. What if God set you free from alcohol to the point you no longer wanted it? I've had people offer me alcohol, and I say, no thanks, i got something better. I've had people say, I want what he's got. <laughs> I say, well, i got the Holy Ghost. I told one coworker, I said, the Holy Ghost is better than beer. And you got these guys, they just live for the weekend so they can go have their beer. And I say, i got something better. I don't need your alcohol. I've got Jesus. Praise God. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. Isaiah 5.11. Nothing good comes from it. Well, if you're thinking so far, so good. Revilers. What is a reviler? Now, when was the last time you were, used that word in conversation? Never? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was thinking that was the case. It's a critic. Ever been critical? Don't raise your hand. They have little good to say about anyone or anything. Their mouths are cesspools of scorn and derision for the accomplishments and successes of others. Born-again believers should have a new language of praise for God and for his people. Some people have difficulty changing their speech patterns. The Apostle James addressed the problem of revilers in the church in James 3, 6 to 10, talked about, you know, no man, no man can tame their tongue. You can tame all kinds of animals. You can tame whales and dolphins. And I've seen guys ride a buffalo through a ring of fire. You can do all kinds of stuff with animals. But can you train your tongue? <laughs> no man can tame the tongue. 
God can tame your tongue. Praise God. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, God can clean up your speech. Praise God. God can change the way you talk. He can change the way you act and the way you think and the way you feel. God can transform you into a new creation. Praise God. You don't have to be the same person you used to be. When Jesus fills you with the Holy Ghost, something begins to change. Praise God. Hallelujah. But God's people should try to say positive things, but everyone, all things are worthwhile. The saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me is not true. Words can kill. In fact, the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. People have taken that and used it to all kinds of extremes. It simply means you can build people up or tear them down. Praise God. Extortioners. An extortionist forces others to pay him through threats of violence. He is a shakedown artist, a criminal who exploits innocent people through threats and intimidation. This kind of sin is part of a criminal lifestyle. Extortioners have no mercy for those from whom they extract money. Their attitude is one of disdain for the feelings and well-being of others. Their mindset is directly opposed to the Christian lifestyle. Today we call them scammers. <laughs> this is so-and-so calling from the CRA. If you don't pay me $3,000 right now, the police are going to arrest you or whatever. Um, <laughs> hang up the phone <laughs> delete the email don't fall for it if you're confused about that stuff go watch Scammer Payback on YouTube for a while you'll, you'll get a good education and all that stuff um, <laughs> Christians are caring merciful and compassionate rather than trying to gain from the sufferings of others Christians need to help others out of their difficulties can I just add we should not be victims of scammers either uh, so, so beware when people try to appeal to the fact, oh, if you were a Christian, you'd do this for me. That's called extortion. <laughs> because if I were a Christian, I wouldn't be supporting <laughs> extortion. Praise God. But we do want to help people in need. And that is uh, throughout Scripture that God cares for the poor and we should too. So no matter how criminal or vile our past lives have been, Jesus makes a difference in our lives. We are a reflection of his loving grace. And there's a scripture in Ephesians that talks about let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work with his hands that we have to give to those in need. I believe that was my dad's life verse. Uh, you may or may not have heard my dad's testimony, but his life ambition before being saved was to be a professional con artist. And he was a professional thief on his way to being a professional con artist when he got saved. So you've heard me tell it, but... I grew up watching my dad return a lot of items. So um, <laughs> he had this mindset of working hard to give to the poor. And I, I don't know anyone in my whole life that was more supportive of helping the underprivileged than my mom and dad. And I honor them today for that. Uh, here's the good news. 1 Corinthians 6.11. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. I just mentioned my dad. <laughs> I'm telling you, my mom's testimony, you know, teenage alcoholic, everything else. Everything I've just listed here is in my family. Some of these are my own. But such were some of you. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Thank God for the cross. Thank God. God for the gospel. Thank God for his mercy and grace. Thank God for his spirit. Yes, that's the way I used to be. That's what I came from. That's my history, my past, my family's past. But thank God for the gospel. Praise God. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been transformed by the power of the gospel. Hallelujah. No matter what a person may have been or may have, been, may have done before coming to the Lord, all is forgiven and forgotten through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus not only forgives our sin, but he forgets our sin. Praise God. There is no reason to look back with shame and remorse over past misdeeds, crimes, or transgressions. Jesus has done away with them all. Although our past may have kept us from being fit for the kingdom of God, Jesus makes us fit and welcomes us as part of his 
kingdom. Praise God. I am thankful for the power of the gospel this morning. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, who you did it with. Jesus loves you this morning. He's calling you out of darkness into his marvelous light to turn your life around. Praise God. He said you are washed. You are washed. Washed. Baptism is a washing away of sins. When a person has repented and is baptized in Jesus' name, he is spiritually washed clean of his sins. John wrote in the book of Revelation how Jesus Christ makes us clean by washing us in his own blood. Revelation 1, 5 to 6 says, As from Jesus, And from Jesus Christ that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. He picked us up out of sin, turned us around, washed us in his own blood. When you were baptized in the name of Jesus, every sin you ever committed was washed away in the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. You've been baptized into the name of Jesus, and that works for your past, but also for your future. Praise God. That any time I sin now, all I have to do is say, forgive me, Lord. I am so sorry. And the blood of Jesus immediately washes away that sin. Praise God. We have been baptized in his name, washed clean of our sins. We are no longer sinners. We are now children of the Most High. In fact, it says here, we have been made to be kings and priests. <laughs> I went from being a sinner to being a king. Praise the Lord. We are kings and priests unto God this morning. Praise the Lord. He has lifted us up out of sin. Praise the Lord. Sanctified. He said, you've been washed, you have been sanctified. Sanctification is the act of being set apart as a holy thing. God now says, you're holy. You're set apart. You're not what you used to be. You're something special. You're something unique that belongs to the Lord. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus, and now you've been set apart as holy. You've been sanctified by the Lord. He says, look, this is my special child. This is my holy child. Praise God. This is a saint. Praise God. A set apart one. Someone that has been sanctified. Praise God. Romans 15, 16 says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. When you get the Holy Ghost living in you, he is making you holy. You now have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, dwelling in these earthen vessels. We started off earlier talking about the fact your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. If you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you now have that Holy God living in you, changing you, making you holy. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. <laughs> Louis Cassell said, at each step of the journey, the question that really matters is not whether we are a little further along than some of our friends and neighbors but how far we have progressed since yesterday. Am I more holy today than I was yesterday? Am I closer to Jesus today than I was yesterday? It doesn't matter how I compare to my brother, my sister, or somebody else, but how am I doing compared to Jesus? Am I getting closer to him? Praise God. Praise God. William Barclay said this, To say that God justifies the ungodly means quite simply that God in his amazing love treats the sinner as if he were a good man. Again, to put it very simply, God loves us not for anything that we are, but for what he is. So justified is our next thing here. Sanctification sets us apart, and justification establishes our right to be set apart. Thomas Watson said, God does not justify us because we are worthy, but by justifying us makes us worthy. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm fallen short of God's glory. I can't do anything to please the Lord. But he now takes me and makes me worthy, makes me holy, praise God, justifies me. Hallelujah. How? By his name, number one. The power of Jesus' name takes away our sins away in baptism. His name is above all others, and by appealing to it and using it, we are established or justified in the kingdom of God. 
When we go down to those waters of baptism as a sinner, we come up totally justified. God says, you're holy now. All those sins you used to have carrying on your shoulders, the guilt, the shame, it's washed away. Praise God. It's gone. Through the power of the Holy Ghost, through the power of the name of Jesus, when you go down in those waters of baptism, God washes it all away. We cannot be good enough. We need the washing of the water of the word. We need the washing of Jesus' name. I need his name to wash me clean. Praise God. Somebody once put it this way, because they were wondering, I'm not good enough to come to church. People say, oh, if I came to that church, the roof would cave in. Well, no, it won't. Um, <laughs> because nobody's good enough. Somebody put it this way. Do you need to get cleaned up to take a bath? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't wash my face before I jump in the shower. You can just get clean while you're in there. And we don't need to try to say, oh, well, I've got to have everything right in my life before I can come to God. We do need to repent. And that's a decision that can be made in a moment. I am deciding to live for God, to live holy, to obey Him, and to follow Him the rest of my life. That's a one-time decision. You're going to have to live out that decision in the day-to-day. There's going to be choices put in front of you. Are you going to continue in that, or are you going to divert from it? But we can... Repentance is simply deciding to live for God, to turn away from sin. There may be sorrow that goes with that over past sins. There may be a great emotion that comes with that. But repentance is simply turning around. It's making up your mind to serve the Lord. Praise God. That's the only prerequisite for baptism. Praise God that we turn from sin and to God. So the first thing is, by his name. That's what justifies us. Secondly, by his spirit. The Holy Spirit in us empowers us to live without sin. Without Christ's presence in our lives, we are subject to live under the power of sin. I'm too weak in my flesh. I can't do what's right. I want to, but my flesh keeps fighting back. My flesh keeps making me do things I don't want to do. Praise God. Romans chapter 7, Paul said it this way. He said, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't do. He said, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? He said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Jesus can set us free from our own flesh and its desires. Praise God. We need the power of the Spirit because the Spirit gives us power over our flesh. Praise God. We have been changed because we have received the message of Jesus Christ. We heard it, believed it, obeyed it, and have been changed by it. Praise God. Romans 10, 16 to 17 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Why would God bother to warn us about sin if there was no solution for it, if there was no remedy for it? Why would God even bother to tell us? But he warns us against all these sins and all these things. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. But There is hope. Hallelujah. There's hope today for every sinner. There's hope today for every failure, for every past mistake, for every time you've failed the Lord. There is hope today, and it's found in the blood of Jesus. Praise God. It's Easter Sunday morning. Jesus conquered sin. He delivered us from sin. Praise God. He conquered death, hell, and the grave, and has made us free this morning. Praise God. So what is the gospel? I'm going to talk about that at 11. But simply put, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. We who are lost in our sins can have hope and an abundant life now and a wonderful place in the life to come. But to get there, we must be born of the water and of the Spirit. Sister Tracy, do you have John 3, 5? Praise God. John 3, 5, and the next to 38. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's the simple answer right there. We must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. We just explained what the washing is. (laughs) The water is baptism in the name of Jesus Christ because it's the name of Jesus that delivers from sin. 
It's the name of Jesus that sets us free. It's the name of Jesus that has the power over sin. So we must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Our response. The gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection. Our response is, I need to repent. I need to die. I need to be buried with him in his name. Praise God. With him, his name, the name of Jesus, the one who died for me. Praise God. I'm going to take on his name in baptism. Praise God. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You don't earn a gift. You don't have to pay for a gift. Praise God. It's free. Praise the Lord. You can have the gift of the Holy Ghost this morning. Praise the Lord. God wants to change your life. Praise God. So the beginning of becoming a child of God is found in the new birth experience. The new birth is not accepting Christ or trusting the Lord as your personal Savior, though those terms have become very popular, uh, but they have no scriptural basis. Uh, They're not biblical terms. We like to use biblical terms. The new birth, according to Scripture, begins with repentance, followed by baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and receiving the Holy Spirit, with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. We don't have time to explain all that this morning, but we do know that when we receive the Holy Ghost, we will speak in another language, just like they did in the book of Acts. Praise God. Before we were saved, we lived selfish, sinful lives. Now we have the opportunity to live exemplary lives. We're able to follow Jesus' example of how to live. As we walk in his steps, we discover the way to abundant living. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Following in the steps of Jesus. Praise God. Uh, how are we doing for time? I've got to wrap this up. <laughs> so 1 Corinthians 8, 12 to 13 says, But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, You sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Remember we started off saying, meats for the belly, belly for meats. Uh, That was what the Corinthians were saying. They were going into uh, the marketplace to get meat for dinner, put on the barbecue. Maybe it had already been barbecued. But it had been offered as a sacrifice to an idol. And the strong Christians were like, well... What's an idol? It's just a piece of wood or stone. It's no big deal. God created meat. Thank God. Eat it anyway. No big deal. They had strong faith. They're like, yeah, this is, it's just meat. Praise God. The weak Christians were kind of thinking, oh, 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 I used to go in that temple, and I used to offer those sacrifices and worship to that God, and this is part of worshiping a false God. I can't eat that. And... When they saw their brother eating it, they were like, whoa, they were offended. So there's a whole lot of stuff we could get into with that. I'm going to save that for another lesson. But we want to avoid offending others as much as possible, even if it means limiting our own freedom. That's a powerful concept we find in this book of 1 Corinthians. That I limit my own freedom so to avoid offending my brother, to avoid offending my sister. I don't want to just say, oh, well, all things are lawful for me. I can do what I want and do something that I believe is not dishonoring God, not disobeying his word, but yet someone else has a personal conviction in that area. I don't want to offend them. Praise God. So our new life in Christ is one that shows a great sense of responsibility for others. We are truly our brother's keeper. Whereas before we would have shown no regard for others, we now put their welfare welfare even before our own. Uh, So again, this idea of meats for the belly, the belly for meats. Don't just follow your appetite. Think about others first. Think about the Lord first. Praise God. What What am I doing? Is it going to cause offense to someone? Is it going to cause someone else to be offended or made weak is the other term. What if they see me doing it and think it's okay? What if they think, oh, well, if he can do it, then I can do it, and then they do it and end up following that path back into where they came from. And that could be a very dangerous thing. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 14 says, And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Our new life is not based on our own ability, but from our close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and his presence in our lives. Praise God. So we are members of the family. We read the scripture. Know ye not your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ, make the members of a harlot? God forbid. We are members one of another as the body of Christ. Praise God. We are the kingdom of God. And also sons and heirs to the riches of God. The new birth brings us into the family of God. His blood makes us worthy. 1 John 3, 1 to 2 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Praise God. Amen. We have been brought into the family. Praise God. We have been made part of the kingdom of God. When we see Jesus someday, we're going to be just like him. Every sin will be forgotten. Every mistake totally erased. We're going to be just like Jesus on that day. When we see him, we shall be like him. It says, I'm looking forward to that day. I don't know about you, but I want to see Jesus face to face. Hallelujah. Yes, that he will have us totally transformed into his image. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Such were some of you, but you are washed. You are cleansed. Praise God. You've been sanctified, justified. Praise God. We have so much to be thankful for this morning. Praise God. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Praise God. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Lord, that your word is like a mirror. Lord, that we can look into your word and see the areas that we need to clean up or change. And Lord, we thank you that you give us the power to do that through your spirit. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would just reaffirm your love to everyone that is here, Lord, that they would know you and love you, Lord, and walk with you, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Jesus. You conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave once and for all. And we give you the praise this morning, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Take a few moments.